Um, th thank you. Thank you, thank you, organisers. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, here, here's here's another story that's going to have some commonalities with the stories we've heard before and some differences. And I've I've put dates up here for for convenience. Now, the first thing this made me horribly discover is that I'm talking about things that have happened over the last thirty years or more, and I have to retire in what fifteen years. Oh no. It really does mean I'm in the late stage of my career. So this was a worrying thought to first encounter when putting this together. But equally, it doesn't mean that I feel like I'm at the end of my career. As you will see, there are things to think about where, where the future is coming from. Okay, this starts at school and 1986. 1986, I am 16. That's uh, in Scotland. That's when you sit your hires, which are the exams that will then decide on your access to university. Uh, at school, what did I, at school I liked geography. I was very, very much geography. Geography was my thing, loved it very much. My dad was a geography teacher at the kind of next school down the road in, in North Edinburgh. And it was, so it was, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was academic and bright. I thought I was the cleverest kid in the year. I was also the youngest kid in the year. I was, I was full of it. The, and other things that I liked at that time, I liked, okay. There's school, things that I'm good at were geography, things that I liked were drama and football. But the things that were then actually motivating me and changing me and making me think about things that I wanted to do were actually drama and football. I was involved with the youth theatre and quite a lot of the people that I was there with, these my close friends in my year at school, then go on to be successful professional actors. It leads to me being able to claim that I acted with Matthew Pigeon in She Stoops to Conquer and On the Razzle. Matthew acted in a film called State in Maine with Sarah Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker was in Footloose with Kevin Bacon. There, I claim my three steps to Kevin Bacon. But then, that, that year, 1986, now this, this, is, this is obscure and very, very specific to me and a small number of other people, the important things about, about that year. Yes, there's other important things that happen, like uh, Chernobyl and Challenger disaster. But my football team in Edinburgh had a very, very, very good year. Very good year. Inconceivably good year. Heart of Midlothian as a team had not won the cup or the league since the, about 1959. My, my father could remember it when he was a teenager. And somehow hearts are are doing so well and they're winning and they're winning and it's going from September and it's going through Christmas and it's into the spring and there's last day of the season. All hearts need on the last day of the season is a draw and even if they draw, Celtic have to win by five goals. They're, we're, we're going to win the league, we're going to win the league, we're going to win the league. There's seven minutes to go and imagine the disaster that happens when the opposition score and hearts lose and Celtic win the game and all is heartbroken. But just the level of commitment, having a, an experience like that to that football team, to that identity, to that Edinburgh, to things with my father, with my, my brother. It then meant that that year, after I got past my hires and was having to decide where to go to university, I couldn't actually possibly bear the thought of not still being in Edinburgh. I mean, much, much as I was, of course, you would apply to other places, I, even then, in a carefully conservative, grew up in Edinburgh kind of a way the thought of applying to go to university in England, I don't know, no, no, no. I don't know about England. All I knew about England then was it was, it was a long, thin country with cooling towers. And, and then when, you, when you got to the other end, you then got on a ferry and went to France. That's all I knew about England. So I had the opportunity, if I'd wanted, I could have gone to university in far off Glasgow, 40 miles away. Oh, no, 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 couldn't do that. So I had to go to university in Edinburgh. I just had to, in my mind. Now, Actually, there, there I am passing those exams, age 16, as I said, I was the youngest person in my year. In Scotland, then you do a sixth year, which is actually, or yeah, you, which is kind of slowed down and preparing you for not actually having to be at school every day of the week. And some people just coast through that and just think that this is, this is the easy life, such as me. And then they also plan to have a year on the dole, in the not, quite, not, not quite the gap year dream, but a year on the dole in North Edinburgh in the 1980s was, it was just, it was, it was what I was doing, what my friends were doing. And this was the kind of thing that was influencing my thinking at that time. But the other thing that was influencing me there was still thinking about theatre. And so by then I was 
that by then I'd been uh, cast in Scottish Youth Theatre and we were doing other interesting big deal plays again with people that go on to a much more successful theatrical and filmic careers than I. But this is a lot of what's shaping my mind. So this is building up to then. So I passed the exams in 1986 and 1987. I spent being unemployed deliberately. The, the, the doll didn't like that, but the and then go to university in 1988. Now, of course, yeah, uh, of course, I've, I said I'd go to the University of Edinburgh. And of course, as I say, I'm going to go and study geography because I love geography, 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 geography. My dad, who was going to the who had gone to the University of Edinburgh precisely 30 years before me to study geography, so clearly I'm being very inspired by my father, had said, no, no, don't, don't, you'll be disappointed. Don't do that. Do something more interesting. Do geology. Geology would be good. Oh, no, no, no. My, my good geography teacher at school, Mr. Hamilton, who doesn't get credited here, said, no, don't do geography. Do something else. You will be frustrated by it. And I was. And I didn't like it. I didn't like the way that it was taught. I didn't feel that it was challenging me enough. I was all set to, 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 to leave uni and, of course, to, to go to drama college. But didn't. I got luckily convinced into thinking about, well, what else are you doing? Because I'd gone to university thinking I was going to university to do geography. I didn't know that there was such a thing as outside subjects until the first day I was at, at university. And when I'd got there to choose those outside subjects, I thought, oh, I don't know. Um, Sociology, that seems quite interesting. And oh yeah, when we would go on holidays when I was a child up North Scotland, yeah, there would be things like hut circles. These looked interesting. Archaeology, yeah, let's sure, let's do that. And first year sociology and, and archaeology were yeah, fine. And then, but then you go into the second year, of course, these are four year undergrad degrees. Second year, you can then choose other outside subjects. And that was, that was more interesting. Kept doing archaeology. Yeah, let's see how this is. And by now, I was officially, semi-officially going to be an archaeology student. I might end up being a general studies student, but I did a great course in Russian studies. Can't speak Russian, but doing a course in Russian history, 20th century Russian history and literature was a remarkable stimulating course to do, especially as it was in 1989 and the end of communist revolutions and anti-communist revolutions. Anyway, but then I, sorry Doug, I keep moving around. Um, and so then by then, let's see, end of second year, it gets pointed out to me that I have to go and do some field work to, to do this geography thing. And I'm not sure about field work. It sounds like I'm being face down in a muddy hole in the ground and I don't think I want to do that. But the opportunity to do field work there was in to go to France, to go to Mont Beauvray in, in Burgundy, fantastic Iron Age site, fantastically interesting archaeology. I suddenly discovered that I do like being face down in the hole in the mud. I do like being in France. I do like learning about drinking wine. I, and I do start my first adult relationship. My first girlfriend is someone that I meet when we were both students digging there. And this is, this is then very important. However, my um, Attention to, to academic detail kind of slackens off a little bit in those last two years at university because I am spending, focusing much more on aforementioned girlfriend and playing football and going to football and things like that. And so when, okay, I was, I was really, really disappointed in myself that I had actually wind up getting a 2-2 a, a degree. 2-2 uh, two -two is a perfectly good degree, but I was disappointed in myself with that. And the feedback I got right there and perhaps the most motivational thing that I've ever heard was from my, my undergrad supervisor, who's Ian Ralston, who some people might know, who, when the results got posted up, and he looked, and he saw, he said, 2-2, and he said, mm, good field worker's degree. And that, that motivated me so much that being a good field worker was not the, the sum total of my ambitions. So there, it's that, there, at that point, I've been I finished my, my degree. I did some field work in Cyprus as well. So I was being in France and Cyprus and this was good. And when I was in Cyprus, I uh, was then offered another opportunity by uh, Eddie Peltenberg, who taught in University of Edinburgh as well. He gave me a chance to go back to Cyprus to do some interesting stuff about doing some experimental archaeology, building, building uh, reconstructions of Chalcolithic houses. And then from that, the opportunity to be a research assistant in his office 
back in Edinburgh. And that led me on a little path over the next three years where every summer I was going off to Cyprus and to Syria with Eddie Peltenberg. And every winter I was back in Scotland. And this was kind of the wrong way round to be doing that. The, but, but it meant that I was learning about having opportunities to do interesting, interesting stuff in Southwest Asia. I was n having lots of responsibility when I was doing that. You, you suddenly find that you're running a team with uh, 12, 15 work men is an exaggeration of work teenagers while, while you're digging. I'm not really getting paid very much. I'm getting, I'm getting a place to live and an experience and a kind of some beer allowance. And then in the winter, I'm back in Scotland and I'm doing some field work, doing some early, early commercial archaeology work. And so there, and I'm getting paid well, an acceptable amount. Don't, don't have any responsibility. Don't have any responsibility for anything beyond my own wheelbarrow. But it was an interesting kind of trajectory. Uh, the, the work in Cyprus and Syria also leads to me then having opportunities to go digging in other places like in Israel and in Lebanon. And the time in Scotland also gives other strange and unexpected experiences, like because I, work, work wasn't constant in Scotland. But I had been introduced to a guy called Robin Turner, who was the National Trust for Scotland's archaeologist. And he said, well, come along and do a little bit of volunteering with me. Ah, volunteering comes up again. And I wasn't sure about that when I did, and that was good. And they did a little bit of research for the NTS. But also, Robin was, at that time, we didn't have CIFA. He was IFA. Was he IFA secretary or treasurer? He, was, he had a, a, a position within IFA. And he was doing work collecting the information from job adverts. And I thought this was very interesting. And he, he said this to me, well, here's, here's, all the, here's our record of all the ad jobs that have been advertised in British archaeology in the last two years. Could you do a little bit of analysis on it? Oh, yeah. And that, to me, was, again, one of these most important opportunity decision points because that, that guided so much more of my career since uh, thinking about jobs in British archaeology, thinking about employment in archaeology has become the thing that is under, underpins almost everything that I do since. Also got to do very exciting things there, like I say, like getting to drive across Europe to take the, the minibus to, to Syria, uh, to go and work in Lebanon. Beirut, Beirut Area 6, 1995-1994 is actually you will be I'm no doubt surprised to learn, I think is one of the most important sites in British archaeology in the middle of Beirut because of the way that we were doing things, because of the way it was exporting and testing Archaeology Southeast uh, Museum of London Archaeology Service models and being able to show that it could be applied in other parts of the world and that it could work well. And I loved it because being in Beirut was just great and I was getting paid properly to do archaeology like that. Now, <clears throat> I could have done different things and I could have got even more involved in that, but by then I had actually committed to the next stage, which was to go back to university, to go to the University of Sheffield. And now the things that were motivating me to do that were winters in Scotland, digging, digging at Stirling Castle. Stirling Castle is a fantastic place. Stirling Castle in January is a horrible place. Digging at Stirling Castle when the enduring experience was going back to my trench to sweep away the snow, to break the ice, to bail out the trench again, was kind of frustrating. And, I didn't, and like I say, I wasn't having very much responsibility. And then being in Syria and having loads of responsibility and all the frustrations of, and I've put up motivation there, Walids. Walids are boys. And the, 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 the teenagers that I was working with were great and frustrating. And just as an experience, it, didn't, it, doesn't, it wasn't totally satisfying. Now, those boys, I think about them a lot, because that was Syria in 1995, say. If they were teenage boys there, and I've only got five minutes, sorry, Jess, oh, and I'm only halfway through, right. Anyway, so yeah, the, the, since then, the war has come to Syria. That, that place we were is now essentially been annexed by Turkey. It was the last place that the jihadis were controlling a border crossing the US Air Force and the Turkish, Air, Turkish Army have done an awful lot of... D anyway. Anyway, so, um, go to Sheffield, 
Sheffield is quite a big deal. It's good. I'm doing landscape archaeology. It is interesting. It is theoretical. It is practical. It's lots of wandering around the Peak District thinking up poems about landscape. But the most important course that I did on there was the Heritage Management module taught by Mike Parker Pearson. And that introduced me to some fantastic new ideas about a thing called PPG 16, which Mike Parker Pearson claimed to have written. Uh, which then prompted me to immediately go out from from the university, from the Department of Archaeology, straight across the road where there was the HMSO um, bookshop and buy a copy of PPG 16. And thinking about this and politics and archaeology and finance and jobs really, really motivated me so much in the, the direction as I continued. So the other thing that then happened right at the very end of the time that I was working in Syria and just before I went to to Sheffield was that I, I fell ill and that was, that was un, unexpected and uh, it ends up in a, you're being, suddenly discovering that you're chronically ill when you're, when, you, when you're 25, which is now well controlled by medication, is upsetting and worrying and it makes you doubt what you're going to do. And, I, and that, having that fall on top of me at a time where different decisions had just been made meant that I ended up going part time on my degree. It took a long time. It got a bit frustrating. While I was failing to finish the degree, I was actually then finding that I had to do some work and I ended up starting up and becoming self-employed, doing things that lead to, that link in very much back to everything I was thinking about jobs in British archeology. span It leads to having, writing a little article about how to get a job in Scottish archeology. span it called Want a Job? Question mark, in, published in Scottish Archaeological News. So I'm still being involved in things in Scotland. I'm doing stuff with Council for Scottish Archaeology. But I get invited to go to an important meeting in York at York Archaeological Trust and to meet, while well, I'm there, to meet a guy called Peter Hinton, who some of you might know, and Tim Williams, who was at Historic England, and Mike Hayworth, who was at CBA. And they'd seen this stuff that I'd written about how to get a job in Scotland, and they said, because it kind of tried to quantify how many jobs there were. And they said, we want to do something like this, but on a bigger scale across the United Kingdom. I was very interested. And so that set up, that's how that started me doing a project called Profiling the Profession, which is collecting data about employment in British archaeology. So I'm running my own little company there doing interesting things like that, also doing some field work, also making decisions about trying to apply for other jobs. I applied for so many different local government jobs. I had so many interviews. I'm so delighted I didn't get any of those jobs. But then at the very end of this time, by then I'm doing quite a lot of field work around Sheffield and the my main competitor was the university unit, Archaeological Research Consultancy at the University of Sheffield, Arcus. I wasn't their main competitor. Their kind of project manager guy leaves. That's Paul Belford, who some of you might know. I apply for that job. I get that job. I go to work for Arcus. The, and that looks like this is where I'm going to be, I think. But I'm not there for a year. And when that previously aforementioned Peter Hinton gives me a phone call. And this, this, this is, again, the utterly key decision point that phone call from Pete Hinton, that phone call that we then later referred to as him cold calling, was to ask me if I wanted to apply for a new job that CIFA had just created, which was called Head of Training and Standards. And it was so right up my street for all these other things that I've been doing, thinking about, about the shape of professional archaeology. And going to work for CIFA, IFA, was also so much right up my street. And so that leads to going to work for CIFA in 2001. And then I'm at CIFA for nine years. The job, the job grows, the job changes, CIFA changes, but I'd still, I'm still able to be doing this interesting stuff about profiling the profession, repeating profiling the profession, getting opportunities to talk to people about doing this on a bigger scale, getting opportunities to work at a European level to find out about European funding and do projects like that. It is just expanding out all these different routes, opening my mind to different things that I, I could keep doing that is very like what I'm already doing, but just bigger and better. And then there's a global financial crisis. And then uh, CIFA has to declare that every single job at the organization is at risk of redundancy. And, and then it's my job that gets made redundant. Well, that's all right in the end. Peter, Peter, Peter Hinton makes and breaks my, my CIFA career. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Global financial conditions make and break my, my CIFA career. 
So that means that I am then back out of Ziva, and what I want to do is I want to go back to running my own company. And here we are, very specifically, I'm able to, I'm made redundant on the Friday, the Sunday is the, the 10th of the 10th of 2010, so it's day zero and then the new company is born and we move forward and we start doing more things that are, are again, still stuff that I'm interested in about heritage management and employment and the like. And we, again, we do doing profiling the profession and we're doing the European stuff. And most, very interestingly at this point, I'm pointed out that I could do a PhD by research publication uh, back at the University of Edinburgh. And that would involve putting together some of these reports. And I am wrapping it up, please. Putting, wrapping these things up and explaining why that they're worthwhile. And then I'm doing other interesting political things. And most importantly at this point is that I am then offered an opportunity, no, interviewed for an opportunity at Fame to become, have being chief executive of Fame being one of the, the my contracts that I, I do through my own company. That's a great chance that I have and that I'm, I'm offered and able to do. And that lets me continue to do this stuff relating to work and employment, but it's getting more and more political and involved. It is, um, yeah. This is the point that where I think I am now. I am still doing the same things that I've been interested in since the 1990s, doing them in different ways and at different scales and employing other people to help. And one of the key person on there that I say was Landward's employee number one, Doug Rox McQueen, who's sitting here at the, the front of the room. And then I get to do other interesting things and these then prompt being offered other interesting things like somehow the University of Liverpool has made me an honorary professor, which I think is a fantastically exciting and grand title, which I, I'm so delighted with and my mother is so delighted with. But it's, it again, it is just an unexpected but positive part of this career trajectory that's been presented to me. Right, there are many more details, I'll fill them in later. Thank you very much, Jess. Thank you all.